uh, something that I believe that can be implemented that is also instructed by the reality of a distributed ledger. Um, I believe some of the uh, K, the Know Your Customer, the, the BSA, AML uh, reporting provisions that even the department are considering do not work in a distributed ledger environment. Um, and so what we're trying to do is propose something that we believe is a good tool um, and that will not regulate us out of being a viable player in the digital asset or crypto space. Uh, the thing that we have to recognize here, I, I, I hear it all the time with some of my friends on the other side of the aisle that want more regulations for traditional bankers, at some point we make the United States less attractive for certain enterprises to be based, and, and crypto is probably, and digital assets generally are likely one of the most mobile enterprises that can simply go somewhere else if our reporting requirements become too burdensome. So we need a light, lean um, regimen, I think, to make this work. Now, to the crypto folks, uh, some of them in the Enforce Act, and I would like to uh, to get your read on it, I, I think that uh, that it's a good first step, um, and and hopefully we will be able to uh, get uh, Senator Haggerty um, co-introduce the discussion draft with me this week. We can at least have that as a first step. The one thing I would tell people in the crypto or digital asset space and saying you know nothing to see here, everything's fine, they're wrong. There needs to be some light regulatory regimen put into place. Otherwise, there are risks. Think FTX. Think a lot of other issues out there that we want to adjust for. We want to create the most hospitable environment for digital assets to thrive. We don't want to overreach and lose the opportunity to be that uh, that uh, jurisdiction. Um, and so, uh, do you again? Do you did you acknowledge the inherent problems with uh, trying to imply the old? Uh, sort of banking construct of BSA, AML, and know your customer to uh, a distributed ledger, digital assets? So, Senator, I do think that, to your point, we have to take a differentiated approach depending on the type of tool. And that's why we would use this, um, even under our proposal, in a risk-based manner. And I, to your point of trying to make the, America, the United States a uh, jurisdiction that is able to win um, even in this space. I think one of the proposals we have in our proposal is giving us the ability to... How do you to calculate the risk base? So that, that's a way of saying I'm going to put my foot on the accelerator or not based on uh, someone in Treasury's assessment of the risk a given entity represents. Is that is that what you're suggesting? How does that give me any certainty, uh, you know, if I'm in this space? Because it seems like to me that could... Uh, that could differ from an administration that listens to Tom Tillis on financial regulations versus an administration that listens to Elizabeth Warren on financial regulations. She's a friend and colleague of mine. We have differences in terms of uh, the role government should play or just how far uh, down they should go. So it sounds like to me that could ebb and flow and not necessarily provide certainty that provides the sort of uh, fertile ground for us being able to define the gold standard of digital assets and crypto regulations. So, Senator, the one thing that I think we've all seen is that as the crypto ecosystem evolves and it evolves quickly, we're going to need to think about the regulatory approach as that evolution takes place. The goal here is to use the regulatory process to do this. And part of the one of the things that the regulatory process provides to these companies is a bit of certainty because there's a notice and comment piece of this where those that's, companies have the ability to provide feedback and then once those rules are in place what we found what kind of time frame my, my time's up i don't want to go too far over i did have a, a closing comment for you mr chair if i may but um what kind of time frame are we talking about uh, uh through notice and comment before you promulgate a rule so senator the um it all depends on how complicated yeah, roughly. Is, but it could be as quickly as a year before okay. you have a full you go through a yep so I guess the question that I have, uh, that we've got an election coming up. There may be a change of administration. If there is a change of administration, there will be a vastly different view about how you go and regulate in the space. And so I, for one, would like to look at, uh, at the possibility of working with your office to address some of the things in your punch list that we agree with so that we may be able to get regulations on the books in this Congress that will certainly not go as far as some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to go but far short of the wild, wild west that we find ourselves in now. I look forward to working with you on that. And, Mr. Chair, the only other thing I was going to suggest, I know that we're talking about maybe this being illicit finance and, uh, and terrorism, but uh, Senator Warren and I have talked about the broader issue 
cartels now, it's passe to launder the old way. Cartels use digital uh, and crypto platforms to launder at scale. And by scale, I mean in the billions. Uh, I think it'd be very helpful. I got a briefing about a year and a half ago from DEA. I mentioned this to Senator Warren before. I think it'd be very helpful to have a joint classified briefing to have Treasury and DEA in the room and see how we can, if, if we get right here and we implement a good regulatory regimen, we're going to put uh, cartels, uh, criminal or transnational criminal organizations and terrorist organizations in a much more difficult position to move cash around because now they're doing it really without any obstacles whatsoever. How the administration uses these tools, including their use of waivers or exceptions. And when bad actors turn to new routes to raise and move money, like crypto, this committee must respond. Our adversaries are going to innovate. We must make sure our illicit finance tools keep up. Last November, the Justice Department, in an effort led by the U.S. Attorney in the Northern District of Ohio, where I live, and the DEA charged 11 people in a drug ring. They allegedly trafficked fentanyl, synthetic opioids, and other drugs across Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Tennessee, and they paid their suppliers in Bitcoin. Just last week, the Wall Street Journal reported how Russian smugglers used the stablecoin Tether to evade sanctions on Russia's war machine. Tether is a quote, key step in the chain, unquote, of illicit transactions, one smuggler said. North Korea's hacked, stolen, laundered hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto, a strategy to avoid sanctions. And these, all these bad actors, North Korea, Russia, terrorist groups like Hamas, aren't turning to crypto because they've seen the ads and bought the hype. They're using it because they know it's a workaround. They know it's easier to move money in the shadows without safeguards like know your customer rules or suspicious transaction reporting. These common sense protections help identify illicit money and keep it out of our financial system. We must make sure that crypto platforms play by the same rules as other financial institutions. We need to make sure we have the tools to crack down on illicit finance with digital assets, just as we would with any other asset. Many, including the Deputy Secretary, have pointed out possible gaps in illicit finance authorities over di digital assets. It's time we work together to close these loopholes and protect our national security. We need to think not just about how terror groups and drug traffickers use crypto, but also about how they could exploit it tomorrow. If we leave loopholes in the books, this problem will get worse, and we simply can't take that risk. Given the range of threats we face, it's clear the administration needs to do more to use its illicit finance tools to stop terrorism, to push back on Iran and Russia and China, to stop the funding streams of the traffickers supplying illicit fentanyl to our children and our community. Like the DPRK and Russia as well. The DPRK, which through numerous complex state-sponsored cyber heists, is able to acquire, launder, and store illicit revenue. It relies on anonymity-enhancing technologies like mixers to hide the sources of these funds, and it leverages over-the-counter digital assets traders to acquire fiat currency. In addition, we've seen Russia increasingly turn to alternative payment mechanisms, including the stable coin Tether, to try to circumvent our sanctions and continue to finance its war machine. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, you both mentioned fentanyl, which is killing too many Americans around this country. What we know to be true is that these drug cartels are increasingly looking for ways to move money that are outside the traditional financial system. Just a few weeks ago, I was in uh, Phoenix, where together with law enforcement, we sanctioned 21 actors who were trying to move financial resources back to Mexico. As we take steps to shut these actors out of our financial system, we should know that they are going to increasingly look to use cryptocurrencies and virtual assets to move things, given our lack of ability to stop them, given the lack of tools. While we're doing everything we can and we'll continue to use the tools we have given you, you have given us, the reason that I sent the term sheet uh, in November was because of what we saw, which was that Today, while Treasury has tools that Congress has given us that we're using to go after terrorist actors and other illicit actors, we need new tools. The term sheet calls for three things. First is the introduction of a secondary sanctions tool targeted at foreign digital asset providers that facilitate illicit finance. The second is, re is a reform centered on modernizing and closing gaps in existing authorities by expanding their reach to explicitly cover the key players in core activities 
of the digital asset ecosystem. Finally, a third reform addresses jurisdictional risk from offshore cryptocurrency platforms, which is a key challenge that we face today. There is clear overlap between the proposals that we have made and the bipartisan bills coming out of this committee. We agree that the use of these emerging technologies by illicit actors can have impacts on our national security, foreign policy, and, econ and the economy of the United States. That's why the United States has a strong interest in ensuring that we have the necessary tools and authorities available and ready to mitigate the risks in this quickly evolving ecosystem, including the dollar-based digital assets in particular. While we continue to assess the tariffs prefer the use of financial products and services, we fear that without congressional action to provide us with necessary tools, the use of virtual assets by these actors will only grow. That is why I look forward to our conversation today and working with this committee to develop the tools we need to protect our national security, protect our economy, and protect the United States of America. Secretary, many of us have raised the alarm about digital assets and illicit finance, particularly after Hamas, after Hamas's horrific October 7th attack. You wrote to this committee last November, you've referred to that, a uh, warning about gaps in our illicit finance framework around digital assets. Uh, briefly, tell us about those potential gaps. What are the risks if Congress fails to act to prevent terrorists and drug trafficking, drug traffickers from exploiting crypto? Senator, I think uh, I appreciate the ways in which the committee has met with us and worked with us here. The greatest risk we have today is that as we take actions, like the 55 sanctions we've placed on Hamas since October 7th, and we monitor the activities in the financial, in the formal financial system, they are clearly going to try and move to get money through the informal system, which includes cryptocurrency. While traditionally what groups like this have done is move money by hand and by courier, which is slower and harder to do, cryptocurrency gives them a route that is easier to do and in lots of ways allows them to get faster access to these currencies. That's why we think it's essential that we get the tools that we have called for in this proposal and that many senators in this committee have sponsored legislation to give us. If we were to have those additional tools, describe specifically what would be a, what what you could do in terms of limiting Hamas's access to funds regardless of their source around the world. Fundamentally, one of the problems set today is that while we take actions to make it harder and harder for Hamas to move money through the traditional financial system, what they're attempting to do is to use everything from individuals to curry cash to cryptocurrency to move money into Gaza. It's hard to move money by people given what's happened, what's going on with the border, but cryptocurrency is far easier. Having a secondary sanctions tool will mean that when we take an action, it will pause other actors from touching the nodes in the cryptocurrency ecosystem that are potentially helping Hamas to move their financial resources and will make it harder for them to move them and potentially even stop their movement in the place where they exist at the moment. Welcome, Welcome to the Crypto teacher. teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you're joining the Patrons. If you're not a part of Patrons, make sure you're hitting the Cash App. And yes, guys, the boogeyman is back. I told you that crypto would become the enemy again. So therefore, they can take down these small and medium-sized banks. And they're going to use the drums of beating. And then also, we have fentanyl keep popping up. Guys, we know the banks are the biggest what? I'll let you finish that. And we've seen this movie before. We've seen these three topics show up every single time before we lead up to the major drums of beat. If you're doing something illegal, crypto is going to be the last thing you use. They've already admitted that crypto was not being used because it's on blockchain. It's going to be tracked. And we're not even going to talk about the history of war on drugs. All it is is the Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic works 100% of the time in order to move you to the agenda. And guys, the agenda is the fourth industrial revolution. Where the robots, algorithms, and drones take the economy over, pay each other with crypto, and the sheep go inside the metaverse. All these politicians are on the same page for a reason. This is a simulation. This is a plan, guys. You have to remember it moves in phases. And remember the crypto teacher told you. Because he knows. When it comes to the NWO. 
It's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. They are um, increasingly, in my view, turning to alternative means of financing, given what we've done in terms of their ability to do the traditional financial system. So, so what does that mean, alternative means of financing? One of those is cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency is a means that uh, while we're using every tool we have, we need additional tools to go after. Okay. And it's, it's not just Hamas and terrorists that are using crypto financing. North Korea, ransomware gangs, drug traffickers, distributors of child sexual abuse materials. Name your bad guy. And crypto is the way that they can move money around. Now, your letter that you sent to Congress follows a basic principle. Activities with similar functions and similar risks should follow similar rules. So I want to look at an example of that. I want to look at one of the middlemen examples, validators. So validators are the middlemen between the payor and the receiver, and they help process crypto transactions. In the traditional banking world, if a bank transacts with somebody who's laundering money, then they are break, breaking the law. But validators in the crypto world don't have that same set of rules. Are there crypto validators right now that are processing transactions for North Korea and pocketing a fee for each of those transactions? There's same for Hamas, same for drug lords and child traffickers. There's reporting that I am familiar with that's public about the fact that those threat actors that you've mentioned are conducting that type of activity. Okay, so bad guys can use crypto right now because we don't have the right rules to keep them out. But I think it's worse than that. We know, for example, that Iran, one of Hamas's biggest funders, makes millions of dollars validating transactions for others that have no connection to Hamas or Iran. So if I wanted to send $1,000 worth worth of crypto to you, Mr. Secretary, is it possible that when I just send it, just uh, to send this, that Iran could be our validator and would be collecting a fee processing our crypto, all of that without either one of us knowing it? So under a transaction like that is certainly possible. Okay, so Iran, which is subject to all kinds of sanctions, is moving money through crypto and actually making millions of dollars validating crypto transactions for Americans and for everyone else, all because we don't have the right anti-money laundering rules in place. One more quick question. If the crypto market grows and the number of crypto transactions increases, does that mean more money would likely end up in Iran's pockets? Everything that we've seen says that when markets grow, threat actors use them more, and we should expect that that is what would happen here as well. Okay, and more activity, more money. You know, currently the House is working on a bill to create a regulatory framework for stable coins. Stable coins make it easier to convert dollars into crypto and crypto into dollars. So they are an on-ramp into the crypto world. If we're going to create new on-ramps, increasing traffic, which is exactly what the House bill does, then we need a regulatory framework that will put the rules for anti-money laundering in place so that we do not have more opportunities for Iran and terrorists and drug lords and human traffickers to make more money. We've got to get those AML rules in place. In addition to sanctioning these individuals, OFAC identified several cryptocurrency addresses associated with these known traffickers. And OFAC's investigation shows a pervasive and deep interconnectedness of illicit drug trafficking and crypto. The addresses identified by OFAC collectively received just under $3.8 million worth of cryptocurrency. So my question to you is, do you think Treasury has the adequate tools and expertise to effectively combat the use of crypto in financing drug trafficking rings? And if you don't, what do you need? Senator, um, Several months ago, Secretary Yellen set up a strike force to go after fentanyl because she sees the threat that it presents not only to American lives, but to um, our national security as well. And what we know is that these actors, these drug kingpins who are often just criminal business 
executives are going are increasingly moving to using crypto, as you mentioned. And the reason I'm here is because we need additional tools from you and the Senate to go after them. Those tools include the ability for us to, for example, go after cryptocurrencies or other parts of the crypto ecosystem that claim to be dollar bit backed, but to be trying to escape U.S. jurisdiction, which makes it harder for us to go after them. We also need to update the definitions in our rules, so they include the crypto ecosystem, so the Bank Secrecy Act and also IEPA. And finally, we would like to have a secondary sanctions regime that allows us to also make clear to traditional financial institutions that you should not engage with parts of the crypto ecosystem that are doing illicit transactions. Taking actions like that and taking actions that would provide us with additional authorities to go after fentanyl would be quite helpful. I think the challenge we have is that taking those actions in the traditional financial system will mean that more of these actors will likely turn to things like virtual currencies to try and escape us unless we update uh, and reform some of the rules that we have today for going after those actors. I'm interested also in learning about, and and this is a new term um, because of crypto, but learning about uh, cryptocurrency mixers. Uh, And you talked a little bit about that, that help facilitate illicit financing. My understanding are that mixers are are, are crypto platforms that enable users to exchange cryptocurrency anonymously by blending the cryptocurrencies of many users to obfuscate the origins and owners of the funds. And in 2022, almost 10% of all crypto addresses tied to illicit activity were laundered through mixers. So, Deputy Secretary, can you explain a little bit about these mixers and the acute risk of bad actors using them to engage in illicit finance. Senator, you, I think you um, made it very clear what they are. There are ways for people and for entities to hide their identity and to move money illicitly through the crypto ecosystem with the hope that they can turn that into hard currency at some other point and be able to get access to their ill-gotten gains. Uh, We've taken some actions against mixers, including using a 311 action to go after them. But my concern is that without the tools that we've requested from the Senate, we don't have the ability to go after these parts of the virtual currency ecosystem that, uh, that are being used by threat actors but may not be based or have U.S. jurisdiction. That's why we think it's essential that we get these tools because As we take steps to go after the traditional financial system, where we have a great deal of visibility where these threat actors exist, they're naturally going to turn to new tools like mixers to hide their identity. Absolutely. And that's why I appreciate uh, the need for the expanded tools of enforcement for areas like this and support it. Thank you. I do think it is so important we address um, the use of cryptocurrency uh, for money laundering and to engage in illicit activities for so many reasons. So going to a different economy. And we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly, we're 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 learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're going. We're recovering, but to a different economy, and it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for for many workers in Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box. Uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to 8% of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, Mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong 
you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American, you know. Uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it is it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it f for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETFs are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told as members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system is kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. Now it was not just a poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And Very much a traditionalist. I like staying with the dollar. You know that from when I was there. It's make, mm -hmm. make the dollar the choice. I hate when countries go off the dollar. I would not allow countries to go off the dollar because when we lose that standard, that will be like uh, losing a revolutionary war. That will be, that will be a hit to our country, just like losing a war. And we can't let that happen. And too many countries now are fighting to get off the dollar. And crypto teacher and the new world order book plus the three kids books is time to reeducate. Also, new cryptos, Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming. While everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the see the biotech stocks. And while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks and you have a wonderful day. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come, Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids books. You know I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis. Whether it's your job, whether it's in your community, we have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share, but this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figures. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends, so therefore we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. 
But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Joshua and Grandma Tim Save the village. Part 2. King Joshua and Grandma Tim Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Joshua and Grandma Tim goes to China. It's mandatory to get Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3 of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.